Well, the other day I was searching in my concordance for that well-known verse, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And when I couldn't find it, I thought, well, maybe I've just got the wrong translation in my concordance, and I have heard different variants, and so I looked those up. God loves you and has a wife for your life. God loves you, I looked up, and has a man for your plan, and I couldn't find those. <laughs> and then I looked up, God loves you and just wants you to be happy. I couldn't find that. I looked, God loves you and has a trouble-free life and a bed of roses awaiting for you. And though it seems like I've heard those kinds of things all my life, I could not find them in my Bible. But as I was stumbling around there, I did come across this verse, John 16, 33. These things, Jesus is speaking, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. He says, in the world, you will have tribulation. Jesus says that in the world of circumstances that are around us, we should expect to find trouble. That word tribulation is the, is the Greek word philipsis. It means trouble, it means difficulty, it means disappointment, it means hardship, it means heartbreak, it means all those things. So in the world, we should expect to find disappointment, difficulties, problems, hardships. We should not expect to find peace and fairness. And yet Jesus says, you can still have those things if you know where to look for them. You have to look in the right place. You see, there is no rest, there is no security, there is no ultimate fulfillment or lasting happiness in the circumstances of this world. You will not understand everything that happens to you, nor will you be able to make sense of it all. Oftentimes your plans will not go the way you planned and you won't understand why. Sometimes things that are tragedies that you think should never happen are going to happen. And other times things that you are, are sure are right and good and should happen, they won't. And you won't understand why. But Jesus says, don't worry about it. You can still have what you seek. Peace, fairness, mercy. You just have to know where to look for it. You don't look for those things in the circumstances of life or in the people around you. You can have them if you look up because they're in a higher place. Jesus says, they're in me. Now, last week, if you were here, Neil, my son, preached a sermon, <clears throat> very personal sermon, about their journey going through life uh, with their youngest son, Ryden, and about the circumstances of his birth and the physical and uh, very serious problems that Ryden has. And I would, his sermon was called, When God Doesn't Make Sense. And I, I would say that the central point of that sermon was that if you have to understand everything, if you have to have all the answers why, before you can accept it and receive from God, then you'll never have peace. And I want to say, this is the place I live in. Most of you know, <clears throat> I've been dealing with a degenerative disease over the last five years, and with it, it's been a bummer. <laughs> Loss and fatigue and just disruption. But I want to tell you the truth. You never get up any day and look at your circumstances and then decide whether or not God is good. Any more than you wake up in the morning and take your pulse to find out if you're alive. Because, my friends, if you were not alive, you could not take your pulse. And likewise, if God was not good, then you who were created in his image would not desire goodness, would not recognize goodness, or desire fairness or truth. 
If God were not good, the world would not be beautiful. If God were not good, he would not set his son Jesus to earth. If God were not good, Jesus would not have gone to the cross. And we know as a historical fact that he did. If God were not good, there'd be no forgiveness. If God were not good, there'd be no church. There'd be no family of God, no people who've been redeemed. You would not be sitting in this house with people whose lives have been transformed by God. If God were not good, the Spirit of God would not be with us right now. But you know that he is. The goodness of God is not something you take a daily vote on. The goodness of God is something that is your starting point. It is your lens. Before you look at your circumstances and your day, it's the lens by which you evaluate your life and receive from God in the midst of things sometimes you don't understand. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will have hardship. You'll have difficulties, disappointments, betrayals. He said, but don't worry about it, because in me, you can have peace. And that word peace, is the, it, behind it is the Hebrew word shalom. And shalom means more than just the absence of conflict. Shalom means well-being. It means wholeness. Somebody described shalom once as that wholeness and well-being that the whole world is searching after. Jesus said, you can have that in me. Now, this world is not our permanent home. It's not your permanent home, and it's not where you're going to be rewarded. It's not where you're going to have everything be fair. That's in the next life where that all works out. But this world is not the way I wish it was, but this world is the place where I walk out my discipleship with Jesus Christ. This world is the stage in which you and I take up our cross, follow Jesus, and learn from him. Amen. I have to accept the world and live in it the way that it is with its germs and its viruses and its accidents and its betrayals and its unexplainable tragedies. I want to tell you that something profound and something very unhelpful happens in the mind of a believer when we substitute Bill Bright's words, God loves you, and has a wonderful plan for your life here. When we substitute those words for Jesus' words, in this world you will have tribulation. But in me, you can have peace. When we make that switch psychologically, here's what happens. A, we begin to put our eyes too much on the circumstances looking for what we want, and too little on Jesus, in whom we have spiritual union. We start living too much in the natural and too little in the supernatural. And our feelings and our responses to things are driven by circumstances instead of our feelings and our actions being the fruit of the Spirit, which you receive as a gift because we're focused on Jesus and we're walking by His Spirit. Now, a lot of people, a lot of Christians, have unrealistic expectations about this world, about what you can get from this world. And they think they can get happiness from this world and fulfillment. And so when it doesn't work out, we have people who are disillusioned and discouraged and embittered at life and at us people around them, and even at religion, because they expected things to happen in this world, and it's not the way the world is. You see, Jesus never promised you that you would have a life of ease and everything would go great. He promised you something much better. 
You promised that he could be a part of your life and you could be a part of his. And that you could live every day drawing from his love and his peace and his joy. Now, it's common for Christians today to talk a lot about the moral decline of America. And to worry about what the future might hold. What might happen? Might we lose some freedoms? Might there be some persecution coming? And we worry about these things because we worry about things we don't understand. How many of you know that? And we don't, because few of us have experienced real persecution or difficulty, because so many of us avoid that kind of stuff and run from it, we don't realize the kind of grace God has set aside for those that are going through real difficulty. Neil talked about it. Or that are facing real persecution. Look at what 1 Peter 4.12 says. He's talking about persecution of the early church. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. He says that we should never consider persecution as some unusual or strange thing, like what's happening but that it's a normal thing for the Christian to face. Now, when uh, Peter wrote this, they were going through the great persecution under Nero, and in that persecution, tens of thousands of people lost their life. And you know the stories. They were fed to the lions in the Colosseums. They were killed by the gladiators. Uh, They were soaked in uh, tar, and they were used as human torches at Caesar's palaces. And that... uh, Both Peter and Paul were killed during this persecution. Peter was crucified upside down, and Paul was beheaded when they wrote these words. This this is the time they were in. But listen to me. Jesus had warned them there'd be opposition, and so they were mentally prepared their whole life for opposition, and so they thrived in the midst of it. It's the golden age of the church. The people had such joy at the time. 2 Timothy 3.12, we read this. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Prejudice, unfair treatment, misrepresentation. It's universal for anybody who even desires to follow Jesus and to swim against the stream. The stream. Now, Last week was camp, but the week before that, on Thursday, we had a friend of mine come and speak to Common Ground. He's a uh, pastor uh, from India. And as we were having dinner beforehand, he was telling me about some of the persecution that's going on in India right now under the Hindus and also under the, under the uh, Islam. And then uh, the next day, I went down to the courthouse, and I was a part of uh, about a thousand Chaldeans down there, and we were praying for the persecuted church in Iraq. You see, persecution is always happening to Christians. Millions of Christians are suffering persecution. It's estimated that 160,000 Christians will be martyred for their faith this year worldwide. So I want to tell you that we should never complain about being ill-treated as a Christian. And we should never worry about any kind of possible difficulties. We should every day thank God that our persecution is so light. That it's so minor. That it's so easy to put up with. Because he said that everybody in this world will find tribulation and difficulty. Most Christians throughout the ages have simply accepted difficulty and persecution as the price for following Jesus. And I just think there's something wrong with our churches, something wrong with our teaching, that there are so many Christians that aren't prepared to embrace life the way it is and the way it always has been, filled with tribulation. People who get so upset with God when something happens that Jesus told them would happen. 
The life of faith requires facing opposition and persecution. Look at what Jesus said to us in Matthew 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. As doves. So what do you think that is like? I mean, that's a difficult and dangerous place to be, to be a sheep surrounded by wolves. How many think that's true? That's not, that's not a fun place to be. And so, I mean, how do you expect a wolf to act? They're vicious. So if we're sheep among wolves, what should we expect? We should expect people to misrepresent us, to lie to us, to lie about us, to misuse their power, to treat us unfairly. And so that being the case, Jesus gives us a strategy. He says, therefore, be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So let's put that up. What does it mean to be innocent as a dove? It means to live above reproach and to do nothing that justifies persecution. In other words, we shouldn't break laws and do bad things that would justify being persecuted. We should live in such a way that even though some people slander Christians, most people just won't believe it. You know, as a Christian, how many of you guys have already discovered you're judged three times as harshly as anybody else? Whether you're a politician or whether, I mean, you do things that all the other politicians or public figures do routinely, and you're crucified. You're held to a higher standard, and that's okay. So just remember, when you do something wrong, not only are you judged, every Christian is judged. And our message is judged. And our Savior is judged. And that's why if you're going to take the name of Christian, you have to be willing to be held accountable by other people. We need to hold each other accountable. So we need to be as innocent as doves, and then it says we need to be as shrewd as serpents. Put that up, please. That means that we act wisely and know the right time, the right method, the right way and place to speak and act. You know, whether we are fruitful and successful or whether we're persecuted, sometimes that depends upon how we act. Everybody knows somebody who, a Christian who acts in such a way, they just make it worse for themselves and everybody else. You guys know people like that? And, but you've also seen times when a person speaks a wise, kind word or does a kind deed and overcomes prejudice and opens a door for the gospel. And so we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to give us guidance to know when and how to speak and act so that people are one to Christ. We're not called to win arguments. We're called to win people. Now, let's go ahead. We're going to move on down that passage a little bit. And in verses 17 through 22, Jesus warns us of different kinds of persecution we can expect. So we'll just go through that quickly. Jesus wants us to be forearmed. He doesn't want us to be surprised when it happens. Verse 17, but beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts. And so we know that there can be laws that are passed that are unfair to Christians, that target your beliefs. So you can be persecuted in court. And they'll scourge you in their synagogue. Well, you can, be reli- you can be persecuted by religious groups. And in the first century, they were persecuted by the Jews. And now around the world, they're persecuted by uh, particularly Muslims, but of course also Hindu in different places. And you'll even be brought before governors and kings. So don't be surprised if the government opposes you or puts hardships on you. Because any government that does not submit to God will see God as a rival power and will oppose his followers. We're going to skip 19, and we're going to come back to that 19 and 20. We'll come back in a second. But again, 21, brother will betray betray brother to death, and father is child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Now, that's one of the worst kind of persecutions and oppositions you can have. When your family mocks and ridicules you and makes it hard, and some of you have experienced that for coming to Christ. But certainly in the world we know 
There's things like honor killing where families kill their children for becoming Christians. And then this one, you will be hated by all because of my name. What does that mean? I think that talks about just the general pop culture. That, you know, you can expect to be ridiculed or mocked or misrepresented. Television and movies and, um, you know, the media in general, news reports. So Jesus says that you ought to be prepared for persecution. Don't be surprised by it. Now, <clears throat> look at Matthew 10, 16. I send you out a sheep in the midst of wolves. You know, sheep have no natural weapons. They don't have any claws. They don't have any big teeth. They don't have anything defensive. As a matter of fact, in the history of the world, no sheep has ever defeated a wolf. Okay, now ready for this. I want you to, everybody to think about what I'm going to say. And yet, Jesus expects to change the world by sending sheep out amidst wolves. How is that possible? What's that all about? He says, behold. In other words, be amazed. I'm sending you out as sheep amidst wolves. Now, just think about that for a minute. What shepherd would ever send his sheep out amongst wolves? That's a natural Certainly a good shepherd wouldn't. We know Jesus is a good shepherd. And besides that, what sheep would ever be willing to go out among wolves? That's unnatural. Sheep don't go out among wolves. Sheep congregate together out of fear. So my friends, if it's not natural for a shepherd to send sheep out, and it's not natural for sheep to go out, then it must be supernatural. Behold, I send you out. Now, let's look at those verses that we skipped, verse 19 and 20. You're going to be brought before courts and governors and synagogues, and then verse 19. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. You see, the sheep have no power or control over the wolves. They are weak in themselves, but now we find out they are powerful in God. And so everything depends upon how you read this. It, it's not natural for sheep to go out among wolves, but when you do, then you discover the power of God with you and operating through you. Now, everything depends upon how you read this phrase. How you read this phrase reveals your faith, and it also reveals your experience with God. Because you can read it this way. Behold, I send you as sheep among wolves, or you can read it the way it's supposed to be read. Behold, I, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, send you. And even though you are only sheep and I'm sending you among wolves, I will be with you. And when they drag you before kings, I will put the words in your mouth. And when they drag you before uh, the court, all put such wisdom in your mouth, they will not be able to confound it. That's how you read it. Think about the Great Commission. Matthew 28, Jesus says, Go into all the world like sheep among wolves. Go out to all the scary and dangerous places and make disciples of all people. That's a little overwhelming. That's a little scary. How do you feel about that? When you feel like God's telling you to go among difficult or hard, unsafe person and tell them about Jesus. But when we read that, we have to remember what comes first and then what comes after. Before those words, 
go out and make disciples of all nations, like sheep among wolves, are the words, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And it ends with the words, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age, until everything is over, I am with you. It's not natural for a sheep to go out among wolves. But when we do, we discover Jesus is with us. We discover fellowship with Jesus. We discover the anointing of Jesus working through us. What if in running from persecution and in running from unfairness, we're really running from Jesus and from fellowship with Jesus? Look at what Philippians 3.10 says. Paul says that, I, that his goal in life is that I might know him, Christ, and the power of his resurrection, here it comes, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Everyone, it seems, wants to know the power of his resurrection. We want to pray and have mighty things be done. You want to lay hands on the sick and see them be healed. You want to pray now people fill with the Holy Spirit. Everybody wants to know the power of his resurrection. But what did Paul know that he wanted the fellowship of his sufferings? What is that? That is when you suffer for his sake. When you suffer because you're following him. When you suffer because you are standing up for his teaching. Not the Jesus you imagine in your head and what you think he feels about things, but what the Word of God tells us he thinks, no matter how unpopular. What does Paul know? What is it of, of Jesus that we discover only in the fellowship of his sufferings? What does he reveal of himself? What do we receive from him when we're willing to stand in his place and risk rejection, or hardship, or whatever it is. I, I've shared before about my friend Richard Wormbrandt, but I do it again because he impacted my life. Richard Wormbrandt, of course he's dead now, I knew him when I was a young man. But Richard had been a pastor in Romania when the communists took over, and they wanted to extinguish the church, and Richard had been one of the people that spoke out the loudest and stood the tallest. And so he was arrested twice. He was in jail for 14 years. And jail there is not like jail here. He was fed sparingly, if at all. He was beaten and tortured almost daily. Three and a half of those years, he spent 15 feet underground all alone in solitary confinement. He didn't have visits from his family ever. In fact, his family was told he was dead. And yet, he stood in my house one day and he told me, I wouldn't sign up to do it again, but I would not trade those 15 years for any other 15 years of my life because of the presence of God, because of the fellowship of the Lord in that time. I saw a video the other day, and it was a man in a... Islamic nation, and he was talking about how he'd been taken into the police station, and they were burning him with cigarettes, but he said as they began to burn him with cigarettes, he immediately had a vision of Jesus, and every time they put that cigarette on him, he felt and saw Jesus hugging him. What if, by fearing and running from the sufferings of Jesus, from rejection, from hardship, from embarrassment, from persecution, what if what we're really running from is an experience of the power and the reality and the goodness of Jesus? 1 Peter 4, 13. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. I guess they were rejoicing because they were suffering his share, his sufferings, and they should keep on rejoicing. If you are reviled, criticized, made fun of for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. How many of you guys like it when the glory of God shows up? How many of you guys have ever experienced the glory of God upon you? 
Maybe some of you haven't, some of you haven't. The glory of God just resting on you and you're thinking, could heaven be any better than this? He says that when we suffer for Christ, we can experience his glory. The last time I went to Cuba, I, I can't travel there anymore, but the last time I went to Cuba, some of the pastors at the conference I was teaching came up to me, and they said, you know what, we just want to uh, communicate to you and to your church how much we love you, how much we appreciate everything you've done, the financial aid, the medicine, the training you've brought in, all that you've done for us, and we want you to know that we pray for you every day, the church. And I said, well, thank you very much. Then they sort of looked at each other a couple of times, and then one continued, but he said, let me, let me tell you what the main thing that we pray for you and for the American church is. He said, we pray that the American church will come under persecution. Now, I want to tell you that people that love you and that are really grateful for what you've done for them do not pray bad things over you. <laughs> they pray what they have discovered to be a tremendous blessing that they want you to share in too. Because in the persecution that they've known, they have discovered Jesus, the churches are filled with his glorious spirit, and Cuba is in revival. <clears throat> I've been reading about Chinese believers and what they've been going through and uh, their experiences. It's very inspiring. And the thing about the Chinese believers, of course, is they encountered persecution. But instead of being intimidated, instead of being afraid of it, they embraced whatever persecution was going their way. And as a result, they not only have great joy, but China has the fastest church growth of any nation at any time in history. The goal of this life, my friends, is not pursuing pleasure it is pursuing obedience to God. That's the key to happiness. It's not trying to find happiness in the events and manipulating the events and circumstances of life. It's to pursue obedience. And then when you pursue obedience, we enter into his joy, his joy that the world can't take away, his peace that the world can't take away, the joy of the harvest. I read another <coughs> story about uh, Russia and persecution in Russia at the time. And uh, in Russia, when they would arrest a husband, he'd throw him in jail, and they'd often ship his family off to basically die, be on their own in uh, Siberia. And so this one family was sent off to Siberia. The pastor was in jail, and they were put in this decrepit house. And in the middle of winter, one night, they ate their last crusts of bread. There was no more food. And so the kids asked their mother, where will we get any more food? And they said, does, does our daddy even know where we are? And she assured them that their heavenly father knew where they were, and they went to bed. 20 miles away, God woke up a deacon in a church. And he said to him, I want you to load up on your wagon all the food and everything that you guys in the church have set aside and I want you to take it to this family of this pastor. And the man said, there's a storm outside. It's below zero. It's likely that my horses and I would freeze to death. God said, I don't care. The voice said to him, you need to go. And so he said, but <clears throat> there's wolves out there. They could kill me and I could never make it back. And then he said he heard the voice tell him, I didn't say you had to come back. I just said you had to go. Now, I mean, you might think that's funny, but I don't think he thought it was funny. But I think it impressed upon him that the point of life is to obey God. And in his case, he came back to tell the story. But we just have to trust God. If we seek pleasure in the things of this life, in the circumstances of this life, Jesus tells us what we will find is tribulation, disappointment, discouragement, heartache, hardship, 
Things will not go the way we plan. Everything will not turn out how we wanted. It'll slip through our hands. But if we pursue obedience, we will enter into the joy of our master, the joy of the harvest. I think that a lot of times we're praying wrong when we only pray to be spared from persecution. And it's okay that we pray that because in the Lord's sup, Lord's uh, prayer, he says that we're to pray, deliver us from evil, and even lead us not into temptation. So it's okay to pray that, it's good. But we should also pray for a strength and a grace and a faith when the hardship comes, when the tribulation or the persecution comes, because we know that it will. Because we just read, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus said, if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. You won't understand it all. It won't go the way you want. But in me, you'll have peace. We've got to quit looking and having unrealistic expectations of life. And we need to have real expectations about what it means to be born again and to walk with Jesus and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit. I want to ask the band to come up here. And I want to say this too. We need to take our eyes off the corrupt leadership. And the systems in America that aren't right. Quit being upset with people because they're lying. Because they're dishonest. Because they're not following laws. Hey, they're wolves. We need to take our eyes and quit complaining about that. And we need to look out and we need to see the harvest. Because there is a harvest of souls in America if we'll go out as sheep among wolves. Jesus did not promise us a life of ease. He promised us something so much better. A life of fellowship. A life of usefulness. A life of the joy of the harvest. All of us need to stop complaining so much that America is what is called now a post-Christian nation, meaning that America used to be somewhat committed to biblical morality, and now it's not. Instead of looking at America as a post-Christian nation, let's look at America as a pre-Christian nation. Just like Cuba was a pre-Christian nation. Just like China was a pre-Christian nation. Just like every square inch on the face of the world has been a pre-Christian nation until the sheep go out among the wolves and let the power of God and the love of God become manifested through them. Give the Lord a hand. Let's Let's rise up.